Okay, everyone, uh, I want to welcome you all to today's webinar. It's called Connecting the Digital Building with Belden. I'm your host, Timothy Johnson, Digital Editor for Electrical Contractor Magazine. And before we get started, I want to get over, I want to go over some housekeeping items. Um, the audio for today's presentation should be coming through your computer speakers or headphones. If you prefer to call in, there's a toll-free number in the event info panel. That should be at the top left of your screen. If you have other difficulties, please reach out to me using the chat window or the Q&A box. Also, please note that today's presentation is being recorded, so if you miss anything or if something comes up and you have to leave, you can come back at your convenience. Um, one note on that, though, Belden is making CECs available for this presentation, so you must attend for 45 minutes to receive credit. Um, you will receive your cert certificate via, via email afterward. Um, finally. There will be a time for Q&A after the presentation. So if you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A box or comments in the chat box. If you're having trouble finding those features, hover your mouse over at the top of your screen. A control, control panel should drop down, and you should see those options there. Now we're going to start the show. Our presenter today is Ron Tellis. Ron is a technology and applications manager for LAN at Belden. He represents Belden in the ISO, WG3 committee and TIA TR42 premises cabling standards, and he serves as the editor for the revision to TIA TSB 184 uh, guidelines for supporting power delivery over a balanced twisted pair cabling. Uh, Ron has a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Purdue, a Master of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the Illinois Institute of Technology, and a Master of Business Administration from Purdue. Um, I want to thank everyone for, for attending. Now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Ron to get started. Ron? Thank you, Tim. And thank you to Electrical Contractor Magazine for inviting me and the Belden team to present to your audience. I'd also like to uh, thank the Belden team, especially Lisa and Amanda, in their help in putting this together. So at Belden and across the industry, the concept of digital building has emerged in which many previously separate network systems come together to support all the functionalities needed to support an entire enterprise building. With this transformation comes new processes and challenges needed to connect the digital building. So we're going to go over what the di a brief section on digital building evolution, take a look at some new deployment strategies that would be helpful uh, in a digital building, also the connectivity options, what, what's going on in the standards to help uh, the uh, connecting the digital building, and then finally wrap up. So let's get started. Let's look at some of the uh, factors going into the evolution into the digital building. I hope you learn a lot from today's webinar. At a minimum, if I would like you to understand the basic concept shown here. There are trends in the industry that are being enabled by advancements in the technology, and that has led to the transformation to, of the digital building. So there's trends of, uh, of the cloud, IoT, and IP convergence. That's being enabled by PoE and wireless, and overall the outcome is digital building. The trend to the cloud. We all heard of the cloud. The cloud is where applications and data reside and we connect to it. The ease and availability at which we connect to the cloud is making the need for each enterprise to have a LAN and data center less of a requirement. In other words, CapEx is becoming OpEx. That sounds good, but what does it mean? It means that designers of buildings are able to put more features and functions into the building. More devices are being added into your building and connected to your building's network. The trend to IoT or Internet of Things, it's a buzzword, right? But it's really happening. It's more than just putting uh, devices onto one network. IoT is about collecting data from connected devices. Once you collect the data, it, uh, the IoT's mentality is to process it, analyze it, take action with that, with that data, and then optimize it, and then send it back to the devices so that they can be optimized. That's the IoT circle shown up there. With all these devices connected to one platform, the better the possibility of a secure network. Once we have a secure, data, a secure network, 
and everything on the same network, now we can start sharing this data, not just within one system, but with all systems that are connected uh, to the enterprise network. So we connect wirelessly. Connections to the wall, or the data that's shown here on the graph, is still happening, but the growth is contracting. Adding devices and wireless access points is the expected growth is the expected growth drivers, and that feeds into the trends we just discussed, and then also ties in the enablers. Another way of looking at the mix of connections of the, of the network is in this graph. What we've always had in the past, we call it traditional LAN. That's the wires going to our to the wall, and then our computers on our desktop computed uh, connected to that uh, connection. That's what the traditional LAN is. But now we have all these other systems that are being connected, uh, and when these other systems, there's comes more uh, devices, and now we have more connections as as well as traditional LAN being. Uh, residing in our network. So it's expected about 2020, you know, around the corner here, that about uh, three quarters would be traditional LAN type of connections and 25% uh, would be this new connectivity or, or, or connectivity from other systems onto, onto this network. An enabler supporting the trends is the ability to deliver power over data lines. So instead of having power and data going to devices. We're sending just a data, a data cable, and that data cable is, is, is connecting to the network, but it's also connecting the device to power. So here's the uh, kind of where we stand uh, with, uh, with PoE and the new, the new standard. The new standard is, is uh, 802.2. 3BT, uh, and it's expected sometime, I think, in September of this year that it'll be completed, and once it's completed, then it'll be incorporated into the 802.3 documentation. And what's unique about this one is that it uh, brings in 60 watts and 100 watts of power. Now, this is uh, um, the power it's at, at, the, at, the, um, at the switch end, and then at the device end, it's going to be something less than that. So what, when we're talking about uh, the power that's, uh, that the devices are going to need, like uh, the uh, point of sale or the uh, internet lighting that you see on the bottom right, and the displays, all those things are going to require uh, switches to, uh, that have the available power so that they can draw the power that they need. So we're going to have, uh, there's lots of acronyms out there. There's PoE, there's PoE+, Plus, there's PoE++, Plus Plus, it gets, there's so many acronyms uh, that it's, it's a bit confusing. and we kind of settle on just looking at the power delivered by the switch and call it type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. And type 1 is what uh, has been out there for, for many, many, many years, the 15 watts of power. Type 2 is the 30 watt, that's the, the AT type of standard that's, uh, that's out there. And then type 3 is the 60 watt. And that 60 watt has always been out there before the standard is ratified uh, through the, the Cisco U, UPOE type of solution. And then we have this 100 watt, uh, which we call type 4. So just to kind of bring some clarity as to when someone's saying PoE++, what are they talking about? You know, it's, it's really better to kind of look at the type of uh, power that the switch is providing. So taking a step away from the market forecast, let's see what's really happening. Last year, Bizria, which is a marketing research film, firm, they pulled over 270 consultants and designers, and they asked, what have you installed in the last 12 months that utilize PoE? The number one answer was wireless access points. That was not surprising. But what was surprising, at least to me, is that uh, this uh, bigger chunk uh, being laptops and LED lighting being next. So it, it's happening. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's moving along, and in fact, so in some cases, they're actually not deploying EC power. They're only using the data cabling to power the devices. And that's what's shown on the right with this pie chart. Is PoE replacing traditional AC power, or is, are you installing uh, you know, both the data lines and the AC receptacles? And 28% on the bottom, on the bottom uh, right there 
are saying that they are replacing data lines with PoE instead of deploying uh, AC outlets. So that's kind of proof that you know all these things that have been talking about is really happening out there. The other uh, technology that's uh, helping to enable the trends is wireless act is wireless uh, speeds. So the wireless networking speeds are increasing. There's uh, currently we have 802.11 AC and it's called Wave 2, and that's able to give us pretty good throughput. Um, if you're the sole uh, user of that access point, you can get somewhere up in the uh, realms of uh, 7 gigabits, supposedly, of throughput. Um, it's going to be a little bit lower than that, obviously, and then as you put more users on there, shown in the red line, more and more users starts to bring that throughput down. So we have this other uh, technology that's being developed to help that out. And that's what's called high efficiency Wi Fi. High efficiency Wi Fi is 802.11.ax, and it's meant to be the way to increase throughput in dense situations. And what they're doing is bringing in this technology of uh, multiplexing in users in frequency, which is called OFDMA, and they're also multiplexing users in space, which is multi user, multi input, multi output, or MU MIMO. And then they also have this higher order modulation scheme that's working out. So it's a lot of, a lot of uh, um, technology that's been used a lot in the in the uh, in the cellular domain uh, is being brought into the Wi-Fi, and that's what this is about. So what does that really mean? Is that instead of what we had before, where we would uh, uh, look at trying to make sure we had coverage over area, we are now going to have to look at coverage for throughput. So if we're going to want to have more uh, access points in areas where there's more people so that they can have the throughput that's needed. Now, uh, 802.11.8x will help that, but I'm understanding, too, that uh, as more people use the uh, AX technology, especially if with uh, calling over Wi-Fi, that they're going to want to be closer to the antenna. So that's going to probably mean that we're going to have more uh, access points than before being deployed. So a quick rundown of the different access point specifications. So with uh, AC Wave 2, uh, as I mentioned, we can have a data rate as high as 7 gigabits. In order to get that, uh, da that data rate, we're going to have to have uplinks to those access points that can handle it. So we have uh, gigabit, and then we have multi-gigabit uh, switches uh, that can go up to 5 gig and even 10, 10 G. And uh, depending on how fast your switch is, you might have to have one or two uplinks uh, to these access points in order to make sure that you have the, uh, the, the capacity on the backbone back to your network to connect all your wireless users. Um, one of the bigger, uh, one of the concerns that I always had was, okay, as we go higher in uh, data rate, are we going to have to have more power being delivered? And uh, the answer that I've been getting out of the experts at, I, at the IEEE is that the power consumption should be about the same, uh, around 25 watts. So that would be the type 2, uh, PoE type 2. And uh, when AX comes out, that should still be about the same. But again, there might be other solutions where they, they need more power, but that's the, that's the expectation. So when we have more access points, obviously we have more cables, and then when we have more cables, our pathways and spaces are, are, are going to get filled. So we have to be mindful of that, especially as we're making new construction. We don't want to fill those spaces to the to the max. We want to leave some room for for future. Uh, so you know we want to be mindful of, of how how densely we pack uh, our pathways. Um, the other uh, there's two things that happen when we get to more uh, densely packed cables. Uh, obviously, we get a, a bundle type of effect happening where we have higher cable density. And then we start looking at bundle effects. Now, bundle effects are twofold. One, if they're delivering power, we can cause a heat uh, to build up. So we have to be mindful of that. And then, secondly, if we're going higher data rates, then we have to make sure that our cables are able to handle the higher data rates and not have uh, what we call alien crosstalk. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. So all these things, uh, the trends, 
and the enablers, the enablers of technology are being combined together in what uh, we're calling the Belden Digital Building, where our wireless land is, uh, is connecting everybody wireless. We can bring in AV and, and collaborate and building management and all these different systems, lighting, life safety, and so forth, they're all part of our, of our digital building. So the question that we have is, who will you look most likely turn to for advice for your extended land infrastructure requirements? The extended land is the digital building requirements. So the, uh, the results uh, show that uh, most people are going to three different types of people. Uh, it's spread across the consultant, the IT department, and the system integrator rather evenly, about 30 uh, people each to those. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we had 11 people uh, answer cabling vendor, and I'm hoping at the end of uh, this webinar uh, you will see that uh, you know we can, we, uh, your cabling vendor, we, we at Belden can be a trusted advisor uh, and help you to make the, the right decisions as well. So uh, that's really the goal here. All right, moving along. Let's move on to deployment strategies uh, to connect the digital building. So one of the one of the uh, deployment stra uh, strategies is the evolution of connectivity, moving from the wall where we normally have always installed our connectors, to bringing those connections up into the ceiling. So instead of having jacks in the wall, we're seeing, in some cases, uh, the, the plugs coming straight out of the ceiling into the device. So as far as the, the strategy, you know, uh, we, have to, we have to plan for how many uh, people and devices, since we're going to not just connect people, we're going to connect devices. We're going to st take a look at uh, how many are going to be dedicated link and how many are going to be wireless. So, so we have to look at area coverage. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going from the wall to the ceiling. Uh, we want to be uh, future-proof, so uh, we want to look at our initial deployment and then also think, uh, is this going to be, uh, we have to think, is this going to be the um, uh, here forever or is it going to change? Is there going to be a move, add, and change? And, uh, it's usually the case that you're going to make some type of change. And then uh, once you have, what you have today you might not have the bandwidth that you need tomorrow. And now that we have higher power delivery, uh, we have to be mindful of, of the ability to, uh, to deliver that power. So those are the things that uh, we have to think about. The answer to those things are options. One option doesn't fit everybody's needs, so we have many options. We have field termination. This field termination of plugs we call direct connect. Um, if you don't like doing field terminations, there's preterm solutions. And then we have to look at uh, uh, the connectivity. Are we going to have jacks? Or are we going to have field plugs? Or are we going to deploy uh, our network, uh, our structured cabling uh, through the use of couplers? So one of the things that, uh, is that uh, we do need to be mindful of as we move from the wall to the ceiling is that now we're going to put all of our uh, connectivity, essentially, up into the ceiling. And we're going to have our main runs shown here in the yellow, uh, our main horizontal runs coming in from uh, our, our TR room somewhere. And at some point, we want to break those off into individual devices. We don't want to have home runs to everything uh, because even though it looks good at first, when it comes uh, down to making a change later, uh, we end up with uh, what we call you know, spaghetti logic or, or spaghetti installation, and we don't like that. Uh, it, make, it makes things messy and, and it, uh, the management's very uh, cumbersome. So we still want to stick with the structured cabling approach. And one structured cabling approach is to have consolidation points using uh, zone boxes. That's what these uh, white rectangles, uh, squares are uh, up in the, uh, in the ceiling. And from that, we can distribute, uh, have some kind of connectivity and then distribute off into uh, our end devices from there. So one thing to uh, to think about is is you know the zone uh, enclosures. Uh, as I said, this is what you'd want to have in order to maintain your structured cabling uh, approach so that it can have efficient moves, adds, and changes. 
uh, it does uh, reduce costs in the long run. Um, it, it reduces the amount of cable material, materials. It uh, can also make sure that we don't uh, spread fire. So you know everything that's in the in the ceiling has to be rated to be in the ceiling. And of course, these uh, applications are are for everything in the, in a digital building. So let's look at some connectivity options. As I mentioned, you know, we're going to go up into the ceiling, and the ceiling is often the plenum space. What is a plenum space? A plenum space is a part of a building that can facilitate air circulation. So this area above the ceiling uh, usually is not just a dead space. It's often a place where the air return is. Um, for that point, we want to make sure that uh, the products that we put up there can, do not uh, uh, condone or, or, or advance the, 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 the propagation of any type of uh, smoke or, or flames and so forth. So we have to have plenum rated cabling. I think we're all very aware of that. But there's also uh, something that not everybody's aware of, and that is the connectivity also needs to have a rating called UL2043. And this rating also takes a look at uh, um, the materials used in the in the devices, the, the connectors, the boxes, and, and 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 so forth, the plugs, to make sure that they uh, also don't uh, um, help any type of uh, fire that could occur to to spread. So here's a few examples of uh, some. Uh, UL2043, which is the, the component spec for plenum rated com, uh, plenum components. Uh, we have the six port box, uh, the rev connect jack, side entry boxes, and, and also the patch cords. So it's uh, something that uh, we need to be more mindful of as more things go up into the ceiling. I mentioned before uh, that uh, some instances, some installers want to go, instead of having all these uh, components up in the ceiling, they want to just bring that, that uh, horizontal cable straight out of the ceiling and, and into the device. And that was, uh, that's a little bit uh, new because it's not uh, the traditional way of doing things. Well, the reason uh, being is that there was no way to really understand uh, if you in, in terminated a horizontal cable with a plug, was it, in, was it installed properly? Uh, there was no way to test it because the field testers would would uh, omit that connection from the test. So we took that on in the standards. We took that on and said, hey, this is what's happening. This is what people want. This is uh, There's no re re reason why we can't. This is still a structured cabling approach. So we, we uh, came up with a direct connect uh, topology where we take the horizontal cable and we can uh, install a plug right on the end of that horizontal cable, and that plug can go directly into the end device. The benefit of that, obviously, is less components. That's one benefit that, that, that can be seen. But also, now we have plenum going straight. Uh, we, we, we maintain our plenum rating all the way uh, to our end device. So in order to do this, you obviously have to have a plug that uh, is able to be installed on the horizontal cable. And there are, uh, there's always been plugs around. Uh, I've heard it called ice cube plugs. So it's those clear plugs that you see on patch cords. And yes, you could take those that, uh, from your local hardware store and install them onto a, a, a horizontal cable. Uh, the problem is that you're going to have uh, some issues because those plugs were not designed to be installed onto that specific cable. Um, the performance is going to be hindered, and also there might be a, a case where a, 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 the plug that you, uh, was, that was, that you pick up might have been only uh, intended for, for stranded wires, and horizontal cabling is typically solid. So the other option is to go to a PCB type, which in that case it kind of separates the performance from the cable, and it's no longer dependent on your, your plug performance. No longer dependent on the cable, so because it's all taken care of in the PC board inside the plug. And then also we have a very reliable connection on the back 
for solid wire, just like we always had for jacks. And that's kind of what the benefit is of going with a, with a PCB type of plug shown on the right. The other uh, reason why this is important on plug performance is that when we put a plug onto a cable, it's got to be centered in a certain range for next. And if, uh, if we take a random plug and put it onto a random cable, we may not be centered. We might uh, be too, uh, too low in performance or too high. Either way, we could fail the next. With a PCB type of plug, we're always centered and uh, we're always going to make sure that we have good passing crosstalk performance. Uh, this is a slide too about the, the ice cube plugs, Just trying to show that uh, randomly selected um, plugs, uh, you know, they need to be uh, they need to be made for the cable that it's going on to, uh, and and oftentimes with uh, with uh, a Cat 5e type of plug, everything's in line where a Cat 6 would be kind of staggered, uh, and that helps to to put the performance centered. So that's uh, another kind of bonus towards using the PC board type PC board type of plug. Um, last uh, one one last uh, comment on uh, PCB plugs. They're universal. They have an IDC cable termination. The uh, performance is controlled through the uh, PC board manufacturing, and we always get a center performance. Another uh, deployment strategy to consider since we're going to digital building is that we're probably going to have some of these devices going outside of the building, shown here with like a security camera on the side of a building. So once we go outside, we have to have a cable that can handle outside. And that cable is called a, a, an OSP or outside plant type of cable. So with an outside plant cable, uh, if we were to uh, uh, connect this uh, security camera to, with an OSP cable and bring it in to our building, we have to terminate that connection within 50 feet of the entry of the building unless, unless it's rated. Okay, so if you have a rated OSP cable, which is uh, can be very beneficial with the digital building. You can take that termination from the out, all the way from the security camera through the wall, past the 50 foot uh, requirement that the NEC has, all the way to your TR room if needed because it's rated for not only the um, outdoor with the CMX, but also the CMR uh, or, or other type of uh, listing needed to go inside a building. So that's another thing to really kind of consider. Okay, so I mentioned uh, before that uh, we uh, worked with the standards on Direct Connect. That's just one thing. I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, what's different in the standards. So we're shaping the, the shaping, uh, uh, sorry, the standards are being shaped. They're being shaped through uh, new uh, TSBs. Those are bulletins put out by TIA uh, that uh, help give guidance for new, new type of technologies or deployment strategies. We have LP. We now have LP rated cables. That's a, a new type of rating from or listing from the UL. Uh, I mentioned Direct Connect in the standards. It's called Modular Plug Terminated Link. So Belden, we like to call it Direct Connect. In TIA. They like to use a lot of uh, fancy words and they, in acronyms, so it's called an MPTL, but Direct Connect is, uh, is, is the same thing. Um, we've always uh, had standards set up to have 26 gauge patch cords and horizontal cabling. That's 24 and 23 gauge, uh, some, in some cases 22. We now have uh, the uh, standards being set up. It's, going to, it's coming for 28 gauge patch cords. Uh, so I'll talk to you about that. And then lastly is this uh, concept of single pair structure cabling, which is uh, something new for for the enterprise market, but in the industrial market it's always been there. And then kind of brush up on that. So I mentioned TSB, so there's a TSB, uh, TSB 184A. It's uh, something I'm very familiar with, as mentioned before. And this is really 
uh, if I could give it its own name, I would say, what happens to the cable when it gets hot? But it's really the guidelines to support uh, up to 100 watt PoE for, for cablings. And it's really talking about here about the bundle sizes that we have to be mindful of. Uh, the bundle sizes uh, are limited uh, to make sure that um, they don't uh, go over the jacketing uh, cable rating. In the standard, in the TIA standards, uh, we like to keep everything at 60 degree or, or, or less. So the guidance in here is assuming that most cases is 45 degree C ambient, and then the bundle size that would give us a 15 degree rise on top of that would be the limit of how, how densely packed we can have those cables. Uh, I mentioned also that uh, when we go higher data rate with that bundle, there's another thing we've got to be mindful of, and that's called alien crosstalk. And there's uh, another technical bulletin, uh, TSB, that's, uh, that, uh, which is a telecommunication systems bulletin, that addresses how to use your existing cable plant for 5E and, uh, you know, existing cable, cable plant of 5E and CAT6 for these multi-gig switches, which is called 2.5 gig and 5 gig base T. So in this, uh, in this document, it kind of uses the uh, alien crosstalk as the background noise and comes up with this risk assessment. So there's a risk assessment in here for category 5E. There's also a risk assessment for category 6. And it also says that there's no risk if you use CAT 6A because 6A is meant for these higher data rates. So before we just say, yes, you can use the uh, cable plant that you have, you have to be mindful that that uh, that's, uh, comes along with risk, and it's really for a brownfield type of application. Uh, if there's any new installations, we obviously want to go to CAT 6A so that there is no risk associated with these higher speeds that, that, uh, that you're going to uh, need in your, in, to connect all your devices and people. The UL and the NFPA created a new cable rating for the safe use of cable. It's called LP rated or limited power cabling. It's in the 2017 NEC, National Electric Code, and it's really kind of their answer to the safe use of, ca of, of cables for delivering power in, in addressing the, the uh, the heating issue that uh, having power going through these cables brings up. So it's, uh, it really kind of addresses the, the safe use of cabling. Also, one of the things that you've got to be mindful of is that LP ratings are not required for LPOE. They're only required if the power is over 60 watts or if you don't uh, control the bundle size. So if you, can, if you go over 60 watts and you can control the bundle size, then, then you don't necessarily need an LP rated cable, but if you're going to go over 60 watts and you're not sure about the bundling size uh, going down the, the length of your, of your cable plant, then you might want to consider LP rated cables. So this is a very busy slide trying to summarize everything that uh, there is about uh, LP rated cables. Um, again, this is what, uh, it's about cables carrying PUE to heat up, that's kind of the gist of the whole thing, and in, within the NEC, there's a there's a table I'm showing here. That's Table 725-144, which is in the National Electric Code, and it says if you're over 60 watts, you and uh, for certain gauges of cables, you have to limit the number of cables in that bundle, depending on the amount of current going through those cables. It's a very confusing cable or a table, um, and there's a caveat in there that if you're under 60 watts, you don't have to worry about it, or if you think you're going to go over that and you're not sure, then you have to go to LP-rated cables. An LP-rated cable is only an LP-rated cable if it's list if it's rated if the um, print legend says LP in parentheses the current. So the example given here is CMP, so that's our cable rating for plenum, and it's a li limited power cable. Uh, for 0.7 amps, so it can go up to 0.7 amps and make sure that the jacketing temperature is not exceeded. That's that's what it uh, that's what it means. I gave a curve on the left 
to give you an example of how the temperature rises for a CAT6 cable and a CAT6A cable. This cable has 500 milliamp per conductor or 1,000 milliamp per pair uh, going through it, and the bundle size uh, goes from zero uh, up to 150, and you can see that the CAT6 starts to get uh, hot uh, faster than the, the, the 10 gig solution, and the 10 gig solution uh, actually can go up to somewhere around 200 and some before we have to worry about that 15 degree temperature rise. So as I said, that rating only addresses the safe use of cables. We have to also be mindful of the performance uh, hit on uh, heat, the performance hit that heat has on the cable. So what I did is I took uh, three different types of cables and I made a channel. It's a four connector, 100 meter channel. And they all did find the insertion loss is what I was looking at, and they all reached 100 meters, no problem. So what I, what I did after that is that I heated up the cable, the horizontal cabling in the middle, up to 60 degrees C. That's to simulate a cable in the middle of a very large bundle uh, carrying PoE. So let's say it got up to 60 degrees C. Is it safe? Yes, because it's, uh, it's at the, at the uh, jacketing rating, so I'm, I'm good there. The question is, am I still meeting the insertion loss requirement? Okay, as cable gets hot, resistance goes up, insertion loss goes up. You have to have the insertion loss requirement met so that your equipment on each end can talk to each other. If that's not met, you don't have a channel. What I found is that there is one cable that I tested, the 10GXS, once I got it up to 60 degrees C, it could still meet the 100 meters requirement. Now I tested other uh, CAT 6A cables and I, 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 never, I didn't see that 100 meter requirement. So that's something to be mindful of as you deploy your PoE systems. Does your manufacturer uh, able to support 100 meters uh, if I was to uh, reach that, that 60 degree mark? 10GXS is able to do that because it has enough margin, and it's also designed, uh, the geometry has good thermodynamic properties, so it kind of keeps it cool. So the question is, is LP rated cable a requirement for PoE? Well, I'm waiting for the answers, and we have 75, 75 out of 200 said no, and you guys are right. The ones that said yes, and the ones that are not sure, I'd just like to reemphasize, it's only required if you're over 60 watts and you're not, sure, you're not capable of controlling the bundle size. That's the only time you have to, it's required. If you can control the bundle size or you're under 60 watts, which most PoE is, then, then you're good with, uh, with your standard cabling. So just threw that question out there just to kind of reemphasize that point. All right, thank you. Let's move on. Direct connect assemblies uh, is what Belden calls a modular plug terminated link. Uh, it's, a, it's a link, it has a jack on one end, a plug on the other, and it, uh, when tested per the new standard, uh, 568.2-D, which is coming out here in a couple months, it will have a normative annex that will allow this and it will meet the permanent link requirements. So, Kind of exciting. We can we can put a plug on the end of a horizontal cable, and now we can test it in the field. That's good. So how do we test? Within the standard, you have to in order to include that plug that you just uh, installed, which is uh, item A here, uh, item A and in, in option A graphic. You have to have a patch cord test head. That's not normally what comes in a, uh, a, a field tester kit, it usually uh, has a channel adapter. The channel adapter does not include that jacket. It subtracts it out. So a patch core test head is known, and you plug it in there, and then all of a sudden you can, you can see what, how good your plug is that you installed. That's per, te that's per standard. There's another option that uh, is unique to Belden, and that's using this thing called a test coupler. 
a test coupler is very low noise, it's centered, it's known. But you use this coupler and, and then you just test, you put it on the end of your, of your direct connect, item A, and then you just test uh, per, your permanent link. And that's the, another way to go about it, but it requires this, uh, this special test coupler. I mentioned 28 gauge patch cords, so we're going to have, uh, you know, these nice, flimsy, very uh, uh, small type of patch cords that are that are very nice to, to use uh, in in um, especially data centers uh, where or, or in tight spaces inside your cabinet where you're kind of running out of space with the larger gauge patch cords. So we're going to include that into the uh, standard as well when that comes out in a couple months. We have to be mindful, though, that you're not going to reach 100 meters uh, because of the insert added insertion loss of these cables. So I put a chart here. Our normal permanent link length is 90 meters uh, and, and less. So if I had 90 meters of permanent link, I can only have 6.2 meters of patch cords, of 28 gauge patch cords. So my channel can only reach 96 meters uh, and so on and so forth as you go down. If I had 80 meter permanent link, I can have a channel up to 91.3 and so forth. So that's got to be put into the design of your channel if you're going to use these patch cords. So the added benefit of ease of uh, deployment comes with the uh, bit of a drawback of, of complexity in design. So that's uh, something to be mindful of there. Future. Where is the future going? You know, it's always been higher, higher bandwidth, higher uh, data speeds, higher, higher, higher. Well, now we're actually looking at, instead of going faster, using new technology to put gigabit over one pair of, of uh, Ethernet cabling. So we're coming out with this new standard 568.5. It's, it's, uh, it's support supposedly for IoT, and that's, that's the goal here. Uh, it's single pair cabling, and we're looking at one gigabit over one pair uh, for a 100 meter channel, and also the ability to deliver PoE, so so deliver power for these end devices. So that's what we're trying to do in the standards: is get things ready for the where the future is going, and 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 create new new ways of uh, deploying structured cabling. Okay, so let's wrap up. Going back to the original slide, one thing that I really wanted you to understand is this simple graphic. There's trends out there cloud, Internet of Things, and IP convergence that's happening because technology advancements in PoE and wireless. Those things combined are transforming our buildings into what we call the digital building. So applications are demanding higher bandwidth and reliable cabling is designed to support these applications, not only of today, but also tomorrow. So what we need to look at is a cable system with integrity so it will lay out the foundation for your most reliable and efficient IT infrastructure. So here's our recommendations uh, as a whole. Uh, we want to go, things are going high uh, multi-gigabit Wi-Fi, so we're supporting data rates going from 1 gig to 10 gig. We have infrastructure connectivity for high power devices, power levels up to 100, mega, 100 watts. Our layer zero, that base that goes into uh, supporting the, uh, the the whole network, needs to have category six and six A cabling, and then we also have to consider new deployment options of zone cabling and direct connect, and also uh, something I didn't mention here, which is the 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 green effect or the LED cert certification, which uh, we are really working hard to make sure that we support everything for the digital building on that. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we'll take a little bit of time for question and answers. So, Tim, I'll turn it over, bit over to you. Thanks, Ron. Um, that, was, that was really informative. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions, and I'm just going to take them in the order that we received them. Um, looks like we got about 10 minutes, so I think we should be able to get to all of them. Um, so I'm just going to roll in. Uh, the first question is, um, is testing direct connect with a test coupler allowed in the TIA standard? Yes. The reason I say yes is that even though it's not explicitly called out within the standard, 
what is called out is a permanent link test. The permanent link test has been there forever, and that's really what this does. I'm adding in a component, and when I pass the permanent link requirement with that component in there, which is a test coupler, and I take it away, I know that I'm going to be better than what I tested. The other thing, too, this test coupler is very low noise. It has very, very low return loss and very low uh, in, in made its uh, next performance, so it's not going to be a factor in your overall uh, system uh, headroom. Okay, great. Um, so the second question, um, can I have a 100 meter channel with uh, 28 AWG patch cords? You can. There's one way to do it, and that's to violate the permanent link requirement. The permanent link in the standard says that you can only go 90 meters. And that's that's the maximum length. If you were to extend that to something like 94 meters, and then put your six meters on there, then you'd have a 100 meter channel. But then you have only a channel, uh, something that meets the channel requirements. So your components would not meet the component requirements. So your permanent link would not meet the permanent link requirement. But overall, your channel would work. So there is a way that you could you could fudge the system. Uh, to do so, um, but you'd have to design that in. Okay. Um, can I install CAT5e cabling for the use with multi-gig switches? There's nothing that says that you that you uh, can't, except that uh, there's you're 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 bringing in risk uh, in doing so, and when you put multiple five gig cables together and you run these higher speeds on them the 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 data is going the data rate from one is going to leak onto the other one it's going to be more noise that the um, system can't control it doesn't know how to subtract that out of the system so you're going to essentially ratchet down from your higher speed to something lower so that your signal noise ratio is somewhere that can be operable so um, it's not recommended for that reason. And it's that recommendation is not just from cabling vendors, it's also from the, the vendors of the equipment. They they actually state that when you're using multi-gig switches on greenfield, uh, on greenfield uh, sites, use CAT 6A so that you're you're good for, for forever, not just good for today. All right, next question. I think this was in regards to slide 11. Um, will this still be considered a low voltage connection? Would an electrician be needed or can structured cable folks still install these solutions? Can we go back to slide 11? Sure. So the question is in regards to uh, the slide on PoE, is it happening? Yeah, that's where I saw the question where I made the note. Um, do you want me to read it again? Yes, please. Sure. Will this still be considered a low voltage connection? Would an electrician be needed or can structured cable folks still install these solutions? Hmm. Um, so I'm not sure if this is the right slide, but anyway, I'll go, I, I try to answer the question as best I can. So. Anything considered low voltage, it's, it's, uh, it's, it has to be less than 60 volts. That's what's called out in, in the NEC, and then that's what's called safe electrical low voltage itself. If something is less than 60 volts, it's not considered uh, life-threatening uh, if it uh, is, is not installed properly, and also there's no way to not install it properly. So when you have PoE and it's 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 less than 60 volts, then that that that's uh, considered self low voltage, and and that's what uh, um, kind of puts you into a different uh, group of installers that are putting in your data cabling, as opposed to a group of installers that are putting in your electrical uh, conduit and kind of and wiring for for AC uh, purposes. Okay. Um, this one. Uh I wonder if you just may want to uh, have anything to comment on. The, the question was, um, have you been part of any smart city or smart village projects globally? 
I've been on certain projects. Um, I personally have not been on any kind of uh, cities or or, or um, villages. Um, the projects that I was that I was on uh, dealt with uh, one of them dealt with uh, the deployment of uh, data cabling to to deploy uh, LED lighting throughout a throughout an office space. Um, they were also uh, putting in uh, the wireless access points for wireless uh, connectivity and also uh, some other devices that they're doing for for their for their security cameras and so forth. So, kind of uh, my personal experience is a little bit piecemeal. I have, uh, but I do know that we have other people that have been involved with the whole thing. Okay. So, uh, yes, on Dalton, partially for me. Okay. <laughs> Um, are all jacks, plugs, and faceplates plenum rated? And this uh, this person says they know the answer, so I think they just want to test you. <laughs> well, a faceplate is not normally uh, in a plenum, so uh, I would say no. Um, those are usually uh, in outside the ceiling. Most jacks and plugs uh, are not plenum rated. They have to go through a, a certification for that. Uh, so. It happens to be that some plugs can meet both, but they have to be listed on the outside in order to show that they've actually been tested. So hopefully uh, that's the answer that the, that they had. <laughs> Sound pretty good to me. Um, next question is, I noticed that the 100 watt PoE utilized four pairs. Does this mean data and power use the same conductor? Yes, it does. Uh, in, in each uh, end of the circuit, there's a transformer, um, and that transformer is a way to couple the uh, um, the data and, and isolate it from the power, and each of those transformers has what's called a center tap. So on one side uh, is the data. It goes through that transformer or, or uh, uh, mag jack, and then on the other side of the mag jack is the, is the center tap, and that's where power is brought in, and there's there's a, there's a similar type of connector on the other side, and that's how they're isolated within the circuit. So um, probably more than what you wanted to know as an answer, but yes, the, those four pairs are delivering data and power uh, at the same time. All right. Um, how can we install CAT6 or CAT6A cables in order to keep the temperature normal? Seems like a loaded question. <laughs> There's no way to keep it normal. What you have to what what you have to do is install it, and the best practice is not to bundle it. But everybody likes to bundle it to keep things neat. So if you're, and, it's, and especially in racks, uh, and, or in, yeah, especially in racks, um, in racks uh, it's usually not so bad uh, because um, well, I guess it, it it could be if you had a, a closed environment, but. Uh, that initial bundle eventually goes and it gets spread out, and once the um, usually in a pathway, uh, the bundling stops and, and it becomes a little more random, and, and things become uh, a little cooler. So, to really answer your question, uh, limit the bundle sizes, and if you have bundles, keep them separated. If you can keep them separated, then each bundle acts independently and, and doesn't uh, doesn't add up to be one big bundle. And that this, guidance uh... is given. That guidance is given in TSB 184A. Okay. Uh, this next question, I think you, you may have answered it uh, just in the last part, but the question is, um, if you're over 60 watts, LP is still not needed if you control, quote, bundle size, correct? That's correct. If you're over 60 watts and you can control your bundle size, LP rating is not a requirement. All right, next question is, do you see passive optical LAN as a beneficial solution to meeting the needs of the digital building? I sure do. That's uh, an, another another strategy that uh, a lot of people are using, especially in hospitality, um, in uh, some in healthcare and so forth. So uh, passive optical networks are a, another way to, uh, to uh, support the digital building. Um, at one end, uh, you have an ONT and OLT, and the other end you have an ONT, and that ONT is the network terminal, and that's where you would spread it out uh, to your individual devices. 
So eventually you do have to have uh, copper going to your end devices. So what I talked about today would certainly still pertain on that. And then before that would be the, the fiber part uh, between the two equipment heads. So it is a very viable solution and, and uh, is a, a topic that uh, will probably come up in the near future for, for another web. Okay. Um, is Plium a uh, U.S. standard? How does LS, LSZH apply? So yeah, Plenum CMP is a, is a U.S. standard. Over uh, in Europe, um, they have a different uh, a different way of uh, of looking at things, and, and it's about um, it's the low smoke zero halogen is about uh, making sure that when when your if a cable is, is uh, in a fire uh, environment, that it doesn't produce halogens. Halogens is what you know is bad for us, uh, we can't breathe, and, and, and it would kill us uh, type of thing. So over, over in Europe, they're more worried about the, the, um, the halogen content of those flames, and then uh, within uh, states with the plenum rating, they're more worried about making sure that the, um, the flame doesn't propagate. So it's kind of a balancing act there. Um, so they're, they're not the same, they're different, and it's really by, by region of how they want to maintain uh, making sure that their buildings are safe. Both ways are, are keeping the building safe. It's just different codes. All right. We are uh, we're at three o'clock, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time, so I'm just going to do a couple more questions. Um, looks like we're not going to be able to get to everybody, but um, we may be able to follow up um, after the presentation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, uh, in a critical environment such as a hospital or surgery center. How is a switch inside the zone box powered in a redundant way? Is a DC power plant in a nearby TR the best option? When you get into a hospital, we have to worry about, uh, about um, it's, it's more than just plenum rated. Uh, that's where we have to get, uh, be mindful of uh, the, what is it called, the hermetic ceiling. Of, uh, so we don't want to have any air going from one, from one unit to the other type of thing. So that's a whole different ball game. Um, so I, I think that would, that question would be better if I followed up in an email to get all the right uh, inputs because it's still more involved than what I talked about here. Right. I also like to add that if we, if we don't get to everybody's questions, I'll follow up with everybody on an email to make sure that all questions are answered. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm just looking here. Here's a pretty good one. Do you think uh, POE lighting also will take over the residential market? That's a good question. I have often thought that myself, especially when I'm sitting in my house looking at where I'd like to have different lights. And if I had data cabling, I know it'd be a lot easier to do. Um, Right now, where it's being deployed most is in office spaces and also in retail. Uh, that's that's where things are really happening. Um, will it happen in residential? I think it's got to. It's gonna it's gonna get there because it has all the. Uh, it's not just about uh, you know, the power savings going to LEDs. When you're talking about LED lighting, it, you're talking about being able to control the environment in the way that you like, and really where do you like to have things best and that's in your home. So I, I see no reason why it wouldn't go into residential. Um, how fast, that's a, that's a different question. All right. I think with that, we've got to, uh, we've got to close this out because we are over 3 p.m. now. So um, we'll let everybody go back and um, get back to work. Um, so uh, with that, I just want to, uh, on behalf of Electrical Contractor and Belden, I want to thank everyone for, for attending. Um, I also want to thank you, Ron, for an excellent presentation. I think this is going to be a really valuable uh, webinar for everyone um, uh, today and in the future. Um, I want to ask everybody to, to be on the lookout for the recording of the event. We'll notify you in an email um, soon about that. And I'm going to go ahead and end the event now, and we hope to see everyone in a future webinar. Thank you very much, Tim.